Welcome everyone. We've got about 25 people that are here with us today. This is a, a networking lunch break uh, talking about women in government. Uh, we've got a few panelists with us today. Uh, Susan Wood is here from Utah League of Cities and Towns, Director of Communications. She is your co-host. And we have Dr. Susan Madden from Utah State University. Uh, we just wrapped up a session uh, with Dr. Madsen talking about struggles and strategies for women in government. And to start off this session, we're going to run a quick poll first to see who all is with us, uh, sort of the representation and diversity of people in attendance. And then Susan's going to share a quick slide from her presentation, and we're going to run another poll that follows up in that slide, and that'll give us a framework for discussion today. So. Go ahead and, and tell us who's here today, and we'll see what our results are. And I want to welcome, a special welcome to Mayor Mann. I think he's the only man in the room. No, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's a couple. Cameron. Yeah, Cameron is there. Cameron is here too. I saw Hi, Cameron. One. I <laughs> guess the couple. name does it. Still <laughs> isn't a manly name. And maybe we can start out by getting from you two. What made you what made you interested in attending this particular session? What do you hope to get out of this, Mayor? Um, I just I, I absolutely agree with things some of the things that Susan says, like uh, that diversity in government helps and we make better decisions when we do that. So I just wanted to see where we're at and if there's anything you know that I could do to help uh, further that cause. You're awesome. Cam. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone. Thank you for participating in the conference and in this caucus. This is a strategic initiative for the League of Cities and Towns. That was one of the first things that we put in place when I became director three some odd years ago when Beth Holbrook was president of the League. And as Mayor Mann said, and as Dr. Madsen has indicated uh, throughout her career, uh, your voices matter and we want to make sure that there's a place in the league for you and that there's a place in local government for you. Uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know much about me, my, my uh, mother was a professor, ran for office. I come from a long line of people who were involved in local government and who were championing, uh, championing the cause of diversity and inclusiveness. And so I'm thrilled that Dr. Madsen has been working with us and and excited just to sit back, listen, learn from you, and figure out how I can improve as a director of the organization, as well as how we can improve the league to make sure that there's that there's a an important place for everyone. So I'm just going to sit back and listen. Thanks. Great. Uh, so really quick, everyone, this is intended to be uh, as interactive as possible. So if you feel comfortable sharing your screen, we would love to see some more faces out there. And share the, your video. Just turn on your yeah. video. Oh, sorry. Turn on your video. I see that. Share your camera. <laughs> share your faces. Yay! Faces <laughs> appear. The yeah. other thing. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. you are all. Um, even if you're eating. Even yeah. if you're eating. Even you're if you're okay. eating, having yes, coffee. Sure. Um, also, if you can go up, if you haven't switched from speaker view to gallery view in that upper right corner, then that'll give you a chance to see that that array of friendly faces out there. Um, and you can be jealous of people's backgrounds or what they're eating for lunch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from here, Susan, do you want to, did you want to bring up that screen and then sure. run the poll and start some discussion? Yeah, we're, we thought it would be interesting. We were hoping to do it on the fly in our last session, but we were just interested in seeing where people would rate their own you know city or town or county or whatever wherever you work your agency and so um john is helping us out in the background and he'll put this poll up so basically it is how conscious are people in your organization of gender and uh, i mentioned before in the presentation that a lot of times people still say this was a blast from the past Let's be gender blind. That doesn't work. Color blind doesn't work. So in gender consciousness, are we 
low awareness. Is your town or city pretty low awareness, uh, low action, on, and call, we call it gender unconscious. So that'll be your first choice. I think our next choice is high action, but low awareness. So you're doing a bunch of things, checking things off the list, but you really don't know what you're doing, <laughs> okay? And then the third would be high awareness, and that means there's deep work of awareness, not just, oh, it's a problem, but deep work. So is there high, deep work awareness, but not much happening? So consciously unconscious. And then, of course, the top is high action, high awareness. So there's deep work, deep understanding of gender, and there's efforts, there's really good efforts going on, not just check the box kinds of things. So um, again, low awareness, low action, or high action, low awareness, high awareness, low action, or perfect, you're perfect, high action. So here we go, where are you? Let me stop sharing my screen, there we go. <laughs> this will be interesting. <laughs> it's going to pop up when it's done, right? It should pop up when it's done. So I think some people are still submitting. We made them think about it, and that's a good thing. <laughs> All right. Oh, there's some that say... Awesome. High action, high awareness. Um, so I would be curious to see like what cities um, people are in that that shows that high action, high awareness. I think just hearing from some of those people. I put that down. I'm in Salt Lake City in Sugar House specifically. Um, and, and I know I know Susie too much on this topic to put any place in any as in the top because there's so many deeds there's so many undercurrents yeah you think you're high action but you're actually not yeah yeah but it's good okay. to hear that there's there's some places that really feel like you're on top of it so so who else um felt like their town is really on top of it that's not in salt lake city well, we were, but then Susan left and, <laughs> and abandoned us. She took your high action away. Well, well hey, no, I, I, put, I put it in there. We did yeah. recently elect two women council members yep. out of three openings. And uh, our staff has a, a lot of female employees. Um, the mm -hmm. office staff is at least 50%. And our assistant city manager is a female no. Uh -uh. We're our, our city manager is is a really good at hiring good people, and he's he's done a good job at at blending who we hire. Often in municipal leadership, it's kind of dependent on who chooses to run for office, really. Well, um, well, Rod and I. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know. Turn on red. You, oh, you tap, and, and and many of you have heard me speak before, right? But I've talked about the tap on the shoulder, the tap, how powerful it is. And in the last last year, in the election for the elections, all different kinds of municipalities, I was the first person. Um, well, actually, the second, with a few with Rod, <laughs> because he got him first. But at least ten people that I specifically said, hey, you should do this. You really can. You have what it takes. You're, you're great um, in the community and being very specific about why. And probably 10, uh, I, I probably tapped more than 10, but 10 of the people that said that I was one of the first people ran, actually ran. And I had about five of them tell me that it took them three people. I was one of three. And for some, Rod was one, I was one, and they got at least one other. But three is what five of those people said. They needed three steps. 
Not interesting. Three touches to like kind of push them into action. Yep. Yep. Dr. Madsen, you went over some statistics that you're going to be releasing soon about um, female leadership in Utah's municipalities. Yeah. And one of those that ranked pretty high was Moab or the southeastern portion of the state. And Mayor Niehaus is joining us now. And oh. I just wanted to hear a little bit from her about, you know, tell us about your council and, and how things have changed even just within the last election cycle. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, sorry, I was in the waiting room waiting to enter for a while. So sorry, I was a little late joining. But um, let's see. Um, I think that, um, Susan, you're right. Um, you only get women elected when women run and when they feel emboldened to do so. And I think that, well, there's, there's always been a pretty good balance of representation, gender representation in Moab. But I think in particular, um, uh, you know, at the, after the last presidential election, a lot of women thought, you know, we need better representation and we need a seat at the table. And so I think um, I, like um, many others, thought, well, let's see who emerges as wanting to run. And, um, you know, I looked at the landscape of uh, men that were, you know, looking to run for the position of mayor. And I thought, well, I'll just throw my hat in the, in the, my name in the hat and see if it sticks. And um, it did. <laughs> and I think we have statistics that show when you, we throw our names in the hat that actually we have a higher um, rate of sticking. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, and, and then I think also um, just, um, Culturally, too, maybe we're just in a in a, a little different place um, down in Moab. But um, I certainly celebrate the diversity that we have. In fact, in City Hall, we've got um, you know an imbalance of more women than men um, in actually, all levels except for our police department. Um, and then we, you know, uh, and then we also have, uh, get to celebrate like men and, um, in the less likely positions, um, than you would normally expect. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, um, when I think of, uh, why it is that way in Moab too, um, we also have a network of, um, scrappy, scrappy women like me <laughs> and others that are just multitask asking experts and um, so you know we we can have children raise them school them from home work from home do the dishes <laughs> and, um, I don't know, can do it all the time, so, um, we've got a network that supports us. and mayor nehas i also noticed mayor kafuzi just joined the call and i hate to be on the spot so i'm sure you're good with it because you're good at impromptu stuff all the time it comes your way right and left. But your council was all men until very recently. Tell us a little bit about how the dynamics changed there. So the point of it is, is exactly what you said. I, I work with men and I love working with men actually. They are, are easy to argue with because they'll throw it all out on the table and I'll throw it all out on the table and then we walk away and, and they don't tend to hold grudges. So I, I don't mind getting into it with men with arguing because they're very um, good practical thinkers. We actually, when I became the mayor three years ago, one of my goals was all of our boards and commissions. Um, we have uh, close to 75 citizens serving on those boards and commissions and only had one woman. And now I can tell you we're up to, I think we, I just put on my last four ladies. So we are over about, I think we're 62% now women on our boards and commissions, which has been really exciting. And not only women, but we've tried to hit all the various um, demographics. I've put um, high school kids on or, college students on I just kind of gone rogue and tried to get anyone that is in the city 
that impacts our city needs to have a voice. And so that's kind of been my model and that's how I've been placing all my boards and commissions. But we do have one, um, she's fantastic. Her name is council member Shannon Ellsworth. So there's two of us now, so progress. <laughs> and another thing to note, Mayor Kafusi is the first woman elected mayor in Provo. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> Even today, when I was running from meeting to meeting and I run by the wall of mayors and I see these 44 stoic men and and I just look at those dudes and think, wow, you guys, this past six months, I wonder how you guys would have handled this rough past six months. <laughs> um, but on the positive side, my picture's not up, but the nail is up. So we, again, are progressing. <laughs> Dr. Madsen, there's an interesting scenario that comes as a result of us celebrating and acknowledging the role that women, the valuable role that women play in local government and every aspect of our society. At what point do we, or how, I guess I should say, do we deal with the criticism that we shouldn't be given any special treatment or any special status because we're women? You know, why are we having a women in local government session? I mean, fortunately, a couple of men came to our session, but why do we get something special just for women? Oh, so many reasons. <laughs> um, that, that is because in terms of people, people are often doing that criticism because they think everything is equal. And if you give more to women, that women will go here. But they're not, it's not. I mean, you look at socialization and we know even Utah is, is, is even more, there's a gap in terms of what we know from the research is that boys are socialized much more often to see themselves as future leaders than girls. And it goes all the way up. So men aspire to leadership. They see themselves as leaders because there's so many men as leaders. They see that. So all the way up, they're planning on being leaders. And when you get to girls and young women and college students and on, we're just behind because of that socialization and part of the culture. Utah has a very distinct difference between what, what people think women should do or what an ideal woman in Utah should do versus, so you get that all the way up. So when you get men and women, let's say 30 years old, you know, um, men are going to see themselves for the most part, not every man but they're just gonna see themselves as leaders. So in the last session I talked about, we can say, well, for women who want to lead, let's give them training, but I was making the case, we have to do extra work to even get women up there, to get them to think that they can be a leader, to get them to aspire, to have any ambition. So if we just, so there's so much work with that. And what we know in terms of, deeper leadership development, not necessarily sessions like this, but deeper leadership development for women, we have to go with calling and purpose, identity. We do all kinds of discussions. And if there's even one man in that kind of session, those are my deep sessions that are hours long. We don't have men in those sessions because, because but, but you men are super welcome today. Thank you. Um, because women talk differently when there's even a man in the room, and we don't talk about those deeper issues that really have a big impact, like imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is alive and well in the state of Utah. Not well, alive and sucks. Can I say that? Uh, there's probably a better way to say that. What is that? What is imposter syndrome? So women so often, and we see this so much in Utah, even though we're competent, even though there's this, because of rumination, because of perfectionism, Rod knows some of this, we've talked about this before, um, we just have this voice that says, you're a fraud, you're a fraud. I, I expect, you know, most women that are mayors and city councils or in, in work of any kind, it's like this voice that says, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe if someone figures me out, they will know that I'm not good enough. And sometimes it's not in everything, but there's one piece that it is. Uh, for me, it doesn't play out in the workplace. It doesn't play out most places, except for I have hard kids and they're still hard. And so I have this voice that says, 
you're not a good mom. You're not. And I get teary eyed even thinking about that. That's like, I'm trying to act like I'm a good mom. I know I'm a good mom. I know I've done what supposed to, I'm supposed to, but that voice is hard. You can see I'm teary eyed even. That's, and I'm a tough woman, but that's a hard thing. So it, it um, and the other thing I, I wanted to say while Emily and, and um, Mayor Kafusi uh, we're talking that one of the best things we can do as women is actually to, it's a combination of two things. Actually learn to be okay with failure. The more we, that's why sports is so good for little girls. Uh, Michelle has heard me talk about this before, is because you learn to win some, lose some, and you're okay. But we're socialized a lot into perfectionism, into happen to be quiet and raise our hands and we get praise in elementary school and all of these things that we hold back because we don't want to fail. But the research on confidence is clear that you have to act to get confidence. It's not it just in your mind. You have to do something. The more we do things, the more we run for office, the more we put in for a promotion, the more we have the option of failure, right? And then the second part of that is what we found, and I see this strong in the state of Utah, that we, and I'll get a little teary-eyed again, that we as women do not know in the state of Utah how amazing we are. First of all, we think we're not supposed to share our strengths, but then we think we're going to be better by beating ourselves up by making a list of all these bad things that we do. And, and women, when I teach them, they can put this many words of bad things. And I'm like, what are your gifts? And then they give me like two. And so the best thing we can do is to have self-compassion. So the more we forgive ourselves, the more we give ourselves a break, the more we actually can get confidence. Did that might seem weird. Does that, does, I'm looking at all of you. Does that make sense? So the more we put ourselves out there and say, I'm going to go for it. And then the more we pat ourselves on the back and say, I did it. I may have lost, but I did it. That's how we can actually get confidence and move forward and do better things um, in the state of Utah with, with women's uh, presence. Dr. Madsen, there are a couple of comments in the chat room. One is from Sherry Llewellyn, who says we do a lot of self-deprecation. Oh, yes. True. <laughs> Another from Angela Choberka, is that how you say it? Angela, maybe you should just chime in about the guilt and the conflicting feelings and tell oh, me that I mispronounced your name. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, and I, I guess I, every day I have these thoughts and I, you have to figure out a way to answer them for yourself mm -hmm. about how you choose to use your time and thinking about it, especially in the COVID world, but in other, um, in regular life as well, just thinking about um, you know, like we said, so many roles that we're supposed to take on. And is it okay for me not to be home a couple nights a week because I'm doing this other work in the community? And what does that mean for my partner? And, and he's awesome about being supportive about it. But I know that that's not always the case. So, you know, we are, um, some of this comes from genetics because we do ruminate more. We do the more we understand about how our mind works, the more we understand. So there's internal work, but there's external work too that needs to be done on systems and processes and all of that stuff within organizations. But we are socialized and a little bit genetics to feel that, Angela, to, to be, I believe me, I, I spent way too many years beating myself up for things because I wasn't the perfect, I'll just say it, Mormon mom. And it was back then. So I, um, I'm okay saying that word. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, um, I'm so over that. Maybe it's my age. <laughs> but uh, the more we understand that women, we do ruminate more, like men, does everybody understand rumination? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Many of you understand. Um, that we can actually make, Angela, more conscious choices. The more we say, okay, I'm doing that again, or I'm having self-doubt, or I feel that imposter, or I'm spinning because I'm a perfectionist and I'm not acting, I'm thinking, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I need to do more work before I present this, whatever. The more we understand the education, the better we are with these, these things. Thank you for bringing that up, Angela. 
Judy Pickell has a question too. Judy? Hi, hi Susan. I've, hey. um, I've served a lot in appointed positions with the county. I've been on Alpine City Council and I am, um, I manage the American Planning Association. Um, one question I have for you is often when a woman speaks forcefully or she knows her mind, yeah. men can uh, recoil from that. And yeah. instead of saying that she's a leader you know, it's, the term is bossy, or if it's um, forceful, it's shrill. So I've played with that a little bit, trying to maybe tone down uh, my conviction or come across um, perhaps in a way that I naturally wouldn't come across just so that I wouldn't push away uh, particularly men or even women who are conditioned to not appreciate <laughs> the the quality or the conviction that I'm coming with. What do you advise? Do you say uh -huh. just go for it or do you say turn it down? Or what, what do you say? I hate having to choose my words so carefully. I know, I know. Oh, that's such an important question. That is such an important question. So you have a decision to make. First of all, there are masculine organizations around us. And so it, it's a pick and choose. First of all, the ideal thing would be, Judy, okay, the ideal thing would be to have everybody in the state take my three-hour unconscious bias training because it opens the doors to uh, having these conversations and in a kind and nice way, having instead of defensiveness, having this curious, like, why do I react like that? And I did one yesterday with I think there were 16 folks and 14 were white men. And it was a fun conversation. <laughs> they were challenging themselves. So education and awareness is kind of the, the big, that's the ideal situation, of course, that then it's open. And, and, and if you were working with Rod, Rod, Rod has worked hard. And I know Cameron too, to, they would not be offended if you, right if you did that, but most people will be still in the state of Utah. So ideally that would be it. On the other hand, I have to say this and I hate it, but if you want to, to make the impact and be heard, sometimes you do have to fit into that culture and change your behavior. I hate it though. I really I hate it. And, um, but the hope is Judy, that if you can do that to keep your voice heard, that you can walk those baby steps <laughs> up right. and have, and one of the coolest ways to do that is to find a male that has some influence and who really wants to try to, I don't know if we all get it, <laughs> but to try to go down the path of getting it and um, having a man in meetings you know, someone that can step up when, when you might be showing your authenticity a little bit more, let's say, who can say, thank you, Judy, I appreciate the compa or compassion or, or help me out, Judy. Um, conviction. The, the conviction, <laughs> that's the word. Confidence. The passion behind that. I think what you're saying is important and we all need to talk about that. I mean, the, I've had to do that with, with just prepping um, a few good man that really would like to learn more and do that. So I don't know if those, I don't have the perfect answers. Just so all of you know though, we collected data on sexist comments in the state. Did any of you participate? We got like 1100 responses. We're using 850. We're going to be doing a brief, it'll be about six months. But what the coolest thing, and Rob will like this, and Cam will like this as well, is we're gonna create tools. Like here are actual sexist comments, but here are some good responses to those. So ways, like, and, and my dream is to have an app um, that you're in the middle of a meeting doing something, and then you can search, how do I respond good to this? <laughs> like with humor or, you know, kind of sharing best practices. Anyway, that's coming. And I think, I think my husband has said he's excited about reading it just because sometimes we, even women and, and men too, we don't know that a certain thing, there's an edge to it. There's a sexist edge to it. You know what I mean? 
Yes. Like, like just asking, Judy, you're the only woman in the room. You may be a, a city council member, but you're asked to take notes. And, and it, mm. it, it's, you know, or get the, the hot chocolate, or do you like how I said that? Or the, <laughs> <laughs> the coffee or whatever. There's just those little things that oftentimes, sometimes we as women don't even realize it because the culture is so strong. I see some of you smiling. Did, have, has that happened to some of you with the taking notes or gal, oh, Susan? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm seeing a number of nods actually. So, so good question, Judy. Good question. Um, so in the chat, we had uh, a comment by Sharon, I think about oh, not qualifying yourself with I'm a female mayor or I'm, I'm a, a woman planner, but just the sort of taking ownership of what you are without qualifying it by gender. Sharon, if you're still with us, do you want to talk a little bit about that comment? <laughs> Maybe she's not. If Sharon is still here, but Susan, is that something that you guys have have Sorry, dove into with your research. Oh, there she is, Sharon. Great. Sorry, Great I, I turned my video, but not my sound. Here I am. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I 100% recognize that there is, um, there's gender inequality and that it's always something we're going to struggle with. But I think that the more we separate ourselves and call ourselves female, I think that serves as an injustice to us because we're asking men and really people in general to consider us as a woman instead of just as, you know, in my case, a mayor. I mean, I never talk about myself as a female mayor. We joke about it, you know, in my county, there are only two of us. For the first four years, there was only me. And, and there were some jokes and things about being the minority and stuff. But really, I just came to the table and, and participated as a mayor and not as a woman. And so I think recognizing recognizing the inequality we still have to move forward and have the confidence to just participate as a person i think it it, it goes a long way when we when we don't make that consideration ourselves so i would just just respond i i um sharon that's a great point i think there are most situations where you don't need to talk about it most of the time i mean but there are occasionally situations um i, I know I know women that believe in that, but then they also have this edge of, I don't want people to ever like consider me as a woman, but taking that extreme edge really dampens the, um, the possibility of them being a really great mentor and lifting other women. So I think there's certain meetings, certain elements where you do talk about being, um, a woman mayor um, or a city council member. I had Mayor Kafusi on one event specifically, and she talked about that, addressed some of those things, but it was mostly for women. So there are certain things. What I would just say is the most important thing is for women who are in the positions that you are and in elected positions and to make sure you are visible to other women and that it's very clear that you do support other women. There's been some strong politicians in the state of Utah that have tried their best to undercut anything for women, anything for women. And you probably know one of them or two of them <laughs> um, and have not, have discouraged other women from stepping forward. So I totally get what you're saying, Sharon. I think that doesn't have to come up and in the majority of conversations, um, but it can it should in some. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like I said, I don't think that we that it needs to be totally out of the conversation, but but certainly, um, you know, be cautious when we just point that out. And I and I will say that um, I am the first female mayor in my city, and I have for the past six years served with three of five council members who are women. So. Oh. You know, we're in a great shape in West Haven. We, I think we have people who are electing public officials who they think will do a good job regardless of their gender, um, you know, but obviously in some cases, I think we bring more to the table than men. And don't get me wrong, we still, we still have um, gender issues in West Haven. We really do. And we struggle with it um, within our council and within our community. But I think that the presence of the women on our council is a great statement for us and a great statement toward 
toward valuing people just for their contribution and not necessarily for their gender. Awesome. That's so awesome. Thank you, Sharon. Or Mayor. <laughs> so Susan, one of the, the comments that came through the, the chat um, from Cam just talking about strong um, sort of guidance from parents and sort of that generational um, sort of influence and you know what we're doing today influencing the next generation. Is that something that you know has has come into play in the research that you've done to show you know the people that are taking action and participating today you know, had that influence of a strong woman in their life who was also involved. Absolutely. Yeah, I have, I have a whole book that I wrote, wrote maybe 10 years ago where I interviewed 10 of the women governors from the United, in the United States. It was right before I shared Sarah, uh, Sarah Palin. Everybody was like, have you interviewed her? Do you remember that whole thing? Um, um, but I interviewed them on, and I've done lots of other studies with different groups, on their lifetime journey of developing leadership, developing their voice. And it was, I mean, it's so clear that um, the strong influences that they have, and some were a grandmother, some were, actually many were like um, elementary school teacher or high school teacher. One, um, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Jean Shaheen. She's been in Congress. She was also a governor. I interviewed her years ago. And, and one of the things that she told me is she remembered uh, with her mother, going with her mother to count paper ballots till two o'clock in the morning. And so those being in you know, that environment and, and her parents just dragged her to places. Um, and sometimes it wasn't the parents, it was, it was just somebody in the community that reached out or, or a role model. But I, I'll tell you either, two, it played out two different ways. One, well, many more, but I'll tell you two. One was just seeing them, just the role model, right? That's called a role model. And the other one, they had mentors and different things, but one of them, and, and some of you have probably heard me talk about this, is that I call them transformational moments. So sometimes in the moment, and some people call them defining moments, Sometimes it only took a moment, someone to say, hey, you can do this or run for, for you know, 10th grade city, you know, uh, school count, what is it called? School council? No, there's a better word for that. Casey's saying it, but I can't hear her. She knows. So <laughs> student in government. Student, yeah, government. That's what I was going for. Thanks. <laughs> Casey's like, oh, that's painful. No, or that's good. <laughs> um, um, you know, that's, those moments, and, and what I've found, and I've taught this to teachers and so forth, they can be as powerful as at an hour or two hours or whatever. When you just stop and say, where are you going to go to college, if, to a high school young woman? Or you, you really have what it takes to go into the sciences, or you, you know, just these little things. Me saying, you know, this is why I think you should run for office. Taking those moments for people just changes women more than men. It, it'll do that to men too, but it, it will change. So those transformational moments. So, so having um, one of you mayors or city council or, you know, just, just take a moment and tell people what you see their potential is can change lives. I think that's a great point. Um, Judy had one more question and I just also wanted to acknowledge uh, Shannon in the chat just talking um, about where we are with sort of gender and binary gender and just not making sure that we're not being exclusive, especially where we are um, right now in our strive for equality and equity in society. So Judy you had a question and then Shannon, if there is anything you want to expand on that, we'd love to hear from you too. Susan, I had a question about, um, this is just more practical response. If somebody is saying something that's overtly sexist and has a, a you know, uh, an obvious uh, motive. I'm fine with calling it out um, and saying something. But when somebody's innocently doing something, you know, w with a with a unknown bias or something, how do you uh, correct it without making them either embarrassed or uh, pushing them farther away? You want to build a relationship, and by pointing it out, you don't want to make them feel like you are the the gender police or that you know you're 
uh, overly sensitive to it. Can you give us some examples of how you would approach a situation where somebody is just innocently saying something that would um, diminish women? So um, if you have the luxury of pulling them aside after, especially if it's, if it's not a huge thing, um, that helps. And, and, um, but sometimes there, there are humorous ways sometimes to put it out there, I would practice with humor. But one of the best skills that I found and that I teach, I do workshops on how to give and receive feedback. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, if we separate feedback from emotions, we're used to saying, oh, you have bad feedback, I don't wanna hear this. But there's an art to really um, giving good feedback. There's a model I teach on, it's called SBI. It's out of the Center for Creative Leadership. Um, and you, you really, you know, you talk about the situation. So in that meeting, we just went left, you know, and then the second is behavior. Now, most of what we say is, is a judgment. So you have to go with behavior. This is, I work for a whole half hour with people on this. So you, you know, you said this specific thing, you don't judge, you were rude or something. You actually, this is what I heard you say. And then the third, the I, is the impact it had on you. So you say, just a little bit ago, you know, just in this meeting, this is what I heard you say. It made me sad, you know, because it made me feel uh, disrespected or something. Um, I, I'm not sure you, you know that that came across, but just wanted you to, I know you have a good heart and want to really lift people. Um, but the more that you can do that um, and give very specific actions, so that's the key, very specific actions. So, so when we say you're rude or, you know, these kinds of things, people are like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, you get all emotional. Um, so that's one of the things. Um, but the more that the people in the room actually start getting it and see the conversation and start you create an environment where you're a little more open and people are not so defensive. The mindset book is a good book, reading book to, to have uh, that. If, if, if your area is not yet open to really good gender conversations or unconscious, but just going with the mindset and how, hey, if you're in a growth mindset, we, you know, we look forward to growing and learning. And in, in the, in the come, you know, in the, in that light, let's all help each other. Um, I appreciate that. That's helpful feedback. Um, so Sherry had a great comment in the chat just about kind of like reframing things in a different perspective instead of like, well, why do we need wider sidewalks? It's like, well, because you've got two stay-at-home dads and they want to be walking side by side, pushing their strollers. Um, so just, you know, finding sort of humorous situations where you can put, um, you know, put different people in a situation or perspective and help to kind of neutralize some of the, the stereotypes that way. Um, I thought that was a, a great comment. And well, one, one other quick thing um, back to, to that comment is, is this is one thing that we can practice and be okay with failing is if we practice like giving feedback using um some of those models it's just little things we can practice on our kids we can practice on people next to us and, and get better and better and not judy having to just have that be a big like the first time we've ever tried something like that we can practice i practice everything on my kids maybe that's why yeah yeah <laughs> I know. my kids have been been drug everywhere and they're like probably the most informed on urban design and planning issues oh. um, because they're like, well, you know, like, why is there not a front door that we can walk right in? Like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, that's true. And at three, you get that. And there's people that don't out there. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We um, are due to wrap this up at one because I know there's more sessions for people to attend. Um, this was a great conversation. We'll keep this conversation going, uh, both through some of the programming that uh, Utah League of Cities and Towns is doing, and also APA Utah and WFRC, um, working to you know have more joint events like this in the future. 
um, we'll save the chat from this and hopefully um, have a way to, to get that out to people. Um, but keep those conversations going with each other, with your family, with your community. Uh, and just another big round of applause for Susan and her wisdom and insights. Thank you, everybody. It was good to see all of you. Thanks for so many turning on the cameras.